Hi, my name is Dan Ariely, and welcome to Arming the Donkeys, a weekly podcast about science. Every week, I will talk to one researcher about one project who have a chat about what they found and what it means for our lives. Dan's guest this week is David Rand, a research scientist at the Harvard Program for Evolutionary Dynamics. David and Dan explore the psychology of punishment. So we're sitting in the, you know where, where we are? We're in the Fuqua Business School. Did I pronounce that right? You didn't, but that's okay. We are the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Did you see the sign in the door? Definitely. In yeah. hindsight, I in remember. Hindsight. <laughs> and I'm sitting here with? Uh, my name is David Rand. I'm from the uh, Harvard Program for Evolutionary Dynamics. The Harvard Program. Do, do you have the Boston accent? Do you say Harvard correctly? Well, it looks like I'm not doing well in my pronunciation today. Okay. <laughs> so um, what is a biologist interested in economics? Uh, what, what kind of things are you interested in? So I'm interested in uh, altruism, generosity, and cooperation, and I'm not prejudiced in my uh, approach for trying to understand that. So, so you, you've been interested in punishment and rewards, and what have you tried to do? So in economics in particular, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on the importance of costly punishment for promoting cooperation, that if there's the threat that someone will pay to punish you, then that makes you behave. Okay, so costly punishment means that if I... Uh, play a game with you, and we create some kind of uh, behavior. If you um, don't behave as I want you to, I'm going to lose money or do something bad for me that would get you to suffer. Right, exactly. And uh, this, this is supposed to be a good behavior because? Uh, because it creates incentives and or it teaches uh, sort of bad behaving people to reform. Okay, so if you behave badly and you get uh, slapped on the face a few times, even though I get uh, my hand hurts as well, this presumably would teach you to behave nicely in the future. Right. That sounds very reasonable. Uh, right, except the problem is that uh, almost all of the experiments that have been done on this have either been uh, one-shot games, so there's just a one-off interaction, or they've been uh, particularly designed to prevent retaliation. Okay, so there's no retaliation means that I have a chance to punish you, but then the game is over. There's nothing else happening. Right, so either that or I have a, so, you know, we have a group of people interacting and we all have a chance to punish each other and then you only find out the total amount of punishment you receive as opposed to who specifically did it to you and you, the names of the people are shuffled every round. This is like academic world, right? Yeah. You, get, you get your reviews, you never know who it was. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Okay, so uh, what, what did you do differently? So we said, well, okay, that's, that's well and good, but if you look around, most of the interactions in the real world that are the really important interactions are repeated interactions. So you're playing with the same person, you have multiple chances, and the other person actually has a chance to do something back to you. They can find you in the bathroom, they can... Uh... <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Okay. And so what we found was that in that setting, uh, punishment – so uh, in, in a first set of experiments, we looked at, at two-player interactions, and we found there that, uh, we had a, that using punishment was pretty disastrous, and you had a lot of retaliation. Okay, so punishment – do people actually use punishment when they know that there's a chance for retaliation? Yeah, it's pretty surprising, but people still do it. Okay. Uh, and, and so, the instinct, so the instinct for – punishment is there, but it's just not as effective because if the other person can punish you back or retaliate, then it just gets to an escalation. This kind of is the Israeli-Palestinian problem, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So it would be fine if everybody just left it on the table and it's like, all right, well, this doesn't make sense here. We shouldn't do it. But uh, people evidently have you know, heuristics that say that it's a good idea, and so they come in and they use it, and it's really a problem. So... You know, in economics, people often say that the, the world is a, a repeated game and people kind of have been conditioned to think about repeated games and that uh, single-shot games are very unique and not typical to our evolutionary history and so on. But here it seems that people are behaving in a, game, in, uh, behaving in a way that is as if they have a, a single-shot game. Because if you're saying people have been adapted, otherwise why would people adapt to uh, punish people because it only is good in single-shot games? Yeah, so I think that, that it's a different kind of mismatch, which is not the mismatch between one-shot and repeated games, but it's a, it's a mismatch between sort of symmetric cooperation games, which is what we do in the lab, and a lot of real-world uh, situations which are very asymmetric with dominance kind of things. You know, I, and so we think that it, uh, it probably does make sense to use punishment in situations where if you're a strong 
you know, player and you want to coerce a weak player, then even it's a, if it's a repeated game, or particularly if it's a repeated game, then it makes sense to use punishment there because you have the upper hand and so you don't have that same kind of risk. So, so the lesson basically is repeated games are, are different and the strategy that's successful in single shot game like punishment might get an escalation that is not very useful. Uh, but, but it could be that something like a hierarchical structure uh, could prevent that from happening because it actually prevents retaliation if you're in a hierarchical right. situation. Right, and then, the, and then the sort of other, the flip side of that is that rewarding, so pay, I pay a cost to give you a benefit, uh, doesn't work very well in one-shot games, but works very well in repeated games. Wow, so it means that in repeated games we want to actually, and, and probably the same thing happens with hierarchy, right? So in hierarchy you might not need it, but in maybe flat organizations with repeated games you want to do more reward than, than punishment. Yeah, I think that that's a reasonable interpretation. Okay, uh, so this is great. So um, have you done anything differently uh, since you understood this uh, result in terms of your relationship with other your advisor or your collaborators? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I actually, it, it's really true that all this studying of punishment and the sort of limitations of punishment and the sort of the benefits of reward really have changed the way that I operate in the world. I mean, not that I was so inclined to punish in the first place, but like I'm always thinking about that in my social interactions of sort of feeling that urge to do something sort of spiteful or retaliatory and being like, you know, that is not what I should be doing in this situation. So um, <clears throat> I, I decided to renovate our bathroom, actually. Sumi and I decided to renovate our bathroom. And uh, two months ago, Almost two months ago, some contractor came and he destroyed the bathroom. He took everything out, and we haven't seen him since. <laughs> and he doesn't show up, and he doesn't answer our calls, and we just don't know what to do. So now that you're an expert of uh, reward and punishment, any advice? Uh, well, certainly I wouldn't hire him again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we, we figured this out without your advice. Thank you, though. <laughs> right. And then the other thing that um, – so in the lab, we're doing repeated interactions between the same set of people, but all of this stuff applies equally well in the domain of reputation and what we sort of called indirect reciprocity. Uh, so what I would say in that domain is you should go on Yelp and you should give this guy a bad rating and yeah. you, know, you should sort of contribute to the public good of, um, of uh, an effective reputation system. Yeah, but, but should, I, should I, for example, threaten him? Should I call him up and say, hey, if you don't answer my call, I'll uh, go on Yelp and give you a bad reputation? Threaten with a punishment? Yeah. Or should I appeal to some uh, reward mechanism? Well, yeah, so I guess there's a question of, of uh, how bad a job he did, but one possibility... He did a great job for one day, then he disappeared. Ah, I see, I see. Well, so, you know, you, if, if you were happy with what he did, you could call him and you'd say, hey, call me back. You know, if you call me back, I will hire you to do more work. But if you don't, you know, I have work that needs to be done. I have money that I would like to pay you and give to you, but you're not, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try this. Although th this particular case, I'm not so sure, but I'll keep you posted. Yeah, all right, let me know what happens. This has been Arming the Donkeys, a weekly podcast with Duke University behavioral economist Dan Ariely. Dan's latest book is The Upside of Irrationality. Learn more at predictablyirrational.com.